Hey everyone, it's Matt here, the Toku Dragon. And today, we're gonna to be talking about Shin Ultraman. And yes, I put a little bit of extra, a little bit extra in there because of the fact that we're talking about Shin Ultraman, a movie that I definitely enjoyed, a movie that I got the chance to see two times in theaters, the subbed and the dubbed version, and I'll be talking about both. But before I do, I just wanna set a few ground rules up because I do wanna talk about the fact that this is gonna be a spoiler-free review. If you want a spoiler-filled review, tell me down below and I'll do one just kinda of going over certain beats of the movie you know, not so much step by step, but definitely talking and, and gushing more about certain things that happen throughout the film that people who've seen the film, like you out there, might actually be able to kind of resonate with a little bit more. But here's the thing, I'm still going to talk about themes in the film, I'm still going to talk about certain scenes, just I'm not going to spoil the film, and I'm not going to go so in-depth that's going to feel like we're going through the film again, as I've seen some reviewers do. So I just wanted to note that right off the bat, just in case you're kind of coming into this. I mean, it should be in the thumbnail and in the uh, you know title of the video or something like that but in the off chance that you know you click on the video and you want to see me just gush about XYZ especially at the end I will not be doing that I will talk about how the end made me feel but just not gonna go beat by beat line by line um, I will be talking about, because I'm talking about the dub, I will talk about some of the actors who did dub it and some of their performances, so I will be going, you know, a bit more in depth. It's not just theme good, like Anno, goodbye, but at the same time, though, uh, again, not just going to go, you know, through every little bit because uh, it's very difficult to find the film, uh, you know, to legally watch it right now. You just can't really in English. So, definitely, I mean, don't get me wrong, though, it has been licensed. If you don't know, I did an entire video on it by Cleopatra Entertainment. Definitely check that video out if you want to see some of the ins and outs of that and how just because they're licensing it on DVD and Blu-ray does it you know for physical release does not mean that we're not going to be able to get it on streaming or anything like that talked about that overall but as of right now legally if you missed it in theaters you missed it and there's been other chances to be fair I just saw it recently over a Wednesday and Thursday uh, the subbed version was on Wednesday dub version was on Thursday if you were there too shout out to you and it was very interesting because they actually had a little bit of trivia beforehand now that it's been you know a, a week or so since I can actually put this up on screen right now I took some pictures of the trivia that they had and it was so interesting to see because I was like wait what because I thought oh let me not get in there too early got my popcorn got my soda walk in and then I straight up see that there's this trivia and something interesting happened as well so maybe it's because I'm in New York and they had a lot of showings for me my showing was about maybe 20 30 minutes away so when I got there I noticed that it was literally about maybe 10 minutes 15 minutes before the um, the movie began and it was really me and this other guy that was it for the sub viewing and I was like huh that's interesting and then by the time it was like five or so minutes before 15 to 20 people rushed in and it was still a it's it's not a small theater but it's just a small theater room and I was like okay so maybe by like half of this room ish is packed all right that's nice uh, and then the next day when I went to the dubbed viewing there were only three people there the whole time and I'm one of the three so I have to say though even though that did happen I'm very happy that there's a dubbed version for anyone who for some reason or another is unable to read or see subtitles having a dubbed version is fantastic and again I'll be talking about it more a little bit later in the video but I just want to say that the dubbed version just right off the bat was good but again let's talk about the sub version now let's get to that uh, when it comes to the translation I do not know Japanese. I cannot say whether or not this was a good or bad translation. I can only talk about readability, being able to understand the text, and there's going to be a lot of scientific jargon mumbo jumbo in there. Can you follow it even if you don't know not just Ultraman, but if you just don't really follow much science fiction? And I'll say this much, right? As someone who is an Ultraman fan, I did not finish the original series. I still have to sit down and do that, but I did get halfway through and I really enjoyed it. And also I've seen and finished a ton of other Ultraman even before they were legally licensed in the U.S. So I'm actually, uh, I got into Toku in 2009 with Kamen Rider and Super Sentai. Super Sentai, of course, because of Power Rangers. So when I first started watching Shinkenger and I first started watching Decade, 
I was like, wait, hold on, what's this Ultraman thing? Oh my god, Tiga! And then that's actually what, you know, the Ultraman Tiga dub on 4Kids, and then I ended up not only owning the Tiga, um, the actual subtitled versions by Funimation, I'm pointing back there because I have them on my shelf behind me, way behind me in the other room, and when it comes to some other toku as well, you know, I was able to check them out, and I do have some DVDs. I mean, I even have the next, like, the Japanese version, because it came with English subtitles. So, when it comes to Ultraman, yeah, I know a thing or two. I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm the Ultraman Ultra fan, but I do know a thing or two. Now, if you aren't, if you just are coming to this brand new wondering, yeah, but is Shin Ultraman, can it be for me, is it for me? Congratulations, it's for you. Now, if you're someone who really knows Ultraman and you're like, man, I really love this show, I really know it, is this for me? Well, congratulations! It is for you as well! So, the way that the film was made, the way that it was structured, it was done in a way where if you really know your stuff and if you really know some of these weird esoteric um, things, and I'll get to some of them in a, or one of them in a sec, if you do know some of this stuff, then it will enhance the experience. But, if you're coming to this completely new, they actually did something fantastic. I say they, talking about the entire cast and crew, not just Anno, did something fantastic with this film where they made a story that clearly is inspired and clearly has monsters and fights that you could, that are from the original Ultraman, not one-to-one -one in some of the way the fights work, and I'll talk about that in a sec. But, the way that it was done and the fact that they didn't take any of the characters from the original Ultraman show, Show, I think is fantastic because if you take the same suits, and I'm talking about, you know, the suits that the SSSP had, the same designs, the same structure, you're just going to be comparing it to the original Ultraman. But in the way that they made this work, they did it in a way that, in my opinion, it's very hard to make that comparison and to sit here and be like, oh my god, you know, comparing it to the original Ultraman, oh, they did this wrong or this different or yada yada. No, it's just a completely separate thing. And I think in doing that and not just having Hayate be there and, and whatnot and having the same helmets and suits and whatnot and actually making it truly an Ultraman in our real world modern time, it really felt like this is how the world would react. Uh, this is my, you know, maybe how Japan would react in some of its politics. And yes, there are some politics throughout the film as well, uh, just like with Shin Godzilla, which I have yet to see, but I have heard from, from friends of mine who were gushing about it, talking about the Japanese politics in Shin Godzilla. When you look at the fact that, you know, this is also another Anno uh, written project, not Anno directed, interestingly enough. The director was actually the same director that he co directed with in uh, for Shin Godzilla. However, you know, in this case, he actually took a step back when it came to directing, although he he will be directing again and writing for Shin Kamen Rider. Something interesting to note because a lot of people talked about these uh, these trilogies, uh, this specific trilogy of Shin films, saying that they are quote unquote Ano works. And let's not do that. Let's definitely give credit to Shinji Higuchi as well, who, by the way, you actually saw, um, I assume it's going to be on the DVD Blu-ray, I hope that it is, there was a special message from him before the movie began, as well as the elite actor as well who played Ultraman, and, uh, well, technically not Ultraman, I'll get to that in also a sec, but when it came to the director, it was so interesting because he was talking about how the COVID crowd, uh, the Japanese post, or, no, nah, I shouldn't say post, the Japanese COVID crowd, when they were kind of loosening restrictions and they were able to show the film, they reacted to the film differently than the American crowd did. I don't know which American crowd he was referring to, be it Anime Frontier or the New York, um, like the New York Film Festival. Unsure, but he was talking about how there was a lot more of a, of a reaction from them and the differences in the crowds and how he was happy to see people laugh at certain parts because this is actually a funny movie. There's some stuff that makes me go, oh, wow, that's the writer's secretly, uh, not so secretly disguised fetish, but there was some stuff that I think can be funny just for general audiences. So, um, talking about the lead actor, by the way, the lead actor was Takumi Saito, who, it's not his first time being in Toku, very interesting, I'll go down the cast list a little bit later, uh, the fact that this isn't any of their first times, uh, for the most part, for, for many of these cast members, being in some kind of Toku project. Um, but when I talked about Takumi Saito, by the way, you know, is he or is he not Ultraman? Well, here's the thing. In this case, they actually, in this film, they definitely made a distinction, which I think that some Ultraman series, especially the original because it was the first outing of Ultraman, sometimes you kind of question how separate Ultraman is from the human that he is inhabiting. And in this case, in this film, they definitely made a really good distinction with that. And by the way, if you're very new to Ultraman, uh, the one of the true staples of the series is, hey, main character, his own person, right, doing his own thing, uh, oh shit, something happened. 
he's pretty fucking dead. But oh, he's on life support, like really, like on by a thread. And then Ultraman goes, "Hey, um, uh, that's really messed up. What just happened to you? What if we merge, and I fight with you, right? Like you transform, and then you're me, and then we fight, and I'm giant." And the guy's like, "Well, I mean, I'm basically dead otherwise." Correct. So I should probably merge with you. It would be but for both of our best interests if you did. But the thing is that, um, in my opinion, depending on the Ultraman you're watching and how it's interpreted, it's hard to tell where the human ends and where the Ultraman begins. This movie did a fantastic job of showing Ultraman becoming human. And really through Takumi Saito, who he did not voice Ultraman when he was Ultraman. Like when he was huge and Ultraman talking to someone, which did not happen a lot throughout the film. But when it did, that wasn't Takumi Saito. And it's very interesting because even in the dub as well, the actor that ended up dubbing over the, the actor, Takumi Saito, did not actually end up, you know, it was two different voices entirely. And I enjoyed that so much, especially when it came to the fight scenes I mentioned earlier. Very different. I thought I had my glasses on. Put my hand up to move my glasses up. Good God, what's happening? What is happening? I was trying to talk about weird things, and I just ended up doing a weird thing. So, when you look at the fights for Ultraman, usually, especially the Shawa era, Ultraman is very much a pro wrestler. Ultraman is doing a lot of moves that, as a pro wrestling fan, I'm like, oh shit, that's pro wrestling. That's hilarious. That's actually really interesting how they've merged both worlds together. Because when you look at, let's say, like, Super Sentai, normally, you know, the giant robot acts like a giant robot. So, the you know, the, you have the mech moving around like this, and then the way it, you know, it kind of puts its arm up and then puts it like sometimes it moves fast, but normally it's like delayed, delayed. Who's ever in the suit is either purposefully delaying the moves because they are, you know, a robot and not like a living uh, person, even the times when they're gods and actually not just robots, but still they move slower or the person genuinely can't move because there's too much shit on them and they have to be dollied around because they can barely move in the suit. That's happened before. So either one, you end up having a, a you know, the protagonists, right, barely kind of moving around. Ultraman, not the case. He is a living organism. He's going to go around and throw around these monsters. And while they did make reference to that in the middle of the film and kind of like uh, they showed a clip as if it was like a YouTube thing and they ended up showing him swinging... Uh, a monster around that to me I was like okay this is fucking fantastic this is hilarious like it's very much like an older Shawa Ultraman fight when he first appeared on the scene though that wasn't the case the way they did the fights they were able to fully utilize the fact that they had this huge budget for this film that it wasn't just a TV uh, tokusatsu budget and they made him weird that's what I love so much about this version of Ultraman they made him alien in every single way that they could. I say they as if it's not just Anno in this case, but still, generally, you know, because of what the actor brought to it as well, because of what the um, the director brought to it as well, when you look at all three coming together, and even just, of course, other actors as well bouncing off of Saito, you end up seeing a very uniquely alien Ultraman in a way that it really, when you juxtapose him with the kind of the more uh, mundane, the, the, the very normal kind of political environment that he's in creates a fascinating look at both Japanese politics and also a true alien coming down. And again, just becoming more human as, as it goes on. But specifically with the fights, I, again, I don't want to spoil directly, but just they did some things. Some things that really made me feel like it was like kind of like an alien meme, where when you see these memes of like aliens being like, whoa, 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 it was, it's just, you know, I am an alien breakdancing, and you're like, that's, that's not human, that's fucking weird. That's what they did with Ultraman. And while that sounds completely awful when I say it out loud, I'm telling you, if you have not seen it, when watching it, it's just truly, it's odd in a way that it just feels like it sticks out compared to, you know, general Ultraman-ness, where he's kind of just hopping in, looking like he's about to just, you know, he's, he's about to lock up with the monster, like it's pro wrestling. And I love that about Ultraman, but again making something different, having it stand out, 
And of course, by the way, I mentioned earlier, you know, not taking the original characters. If you're unfamiliar with this concept, it is not only a complete reboot, but it is just completely separate in every which way from anything that Ultraman has ever done. So even though it is Ultraman's first outing on Earth, even though he has never set foot on Earth before, it's not so much that this is going to be the start of a trilogy or a new reboot or a new TV show, even though there is some talks that there might eventually, potentially be, at least Anno is pushing for it, a Shin Ultra 7, Ultra 7 being the sequel to Ultraman. At the same time, though, that does not mean in any way that this is going to be some like multimedia franchise although it's funny because one day I'm sure this is gonna bite me in the ass me saying this but I say this just because of the fact that again like I mentioned earlier you really don't have to know much about Ultraman to jump into this like I said before they don't take the characters they take well I say the characters they don't take the main SSSP the actual like the uh, very like paramilitary force that kind of fights with and uh, against, fights with Ultraman and against the monsters, they don't take them and just say, oh yeah, let's just give them, you know, their general costumes and whatnot. No, these are just a few people in suits. These are government suits, a government agency, and it's something that when I saw it initially, I was like, ah man, this is what they did to them? I don't know about this. But the way the characters worked off of each other, again, the actors brought so much to this, the way they worked off of each other, the way they worked off of Saito as both his character originally and then as Ultraman, it just felt very, it felt real, but in a way that didn't seem like it was trying to say, ah, oh, yeah, this is how real life is, doesn't it suck? No, it was Anno showing, hey, this is how things would really go down. Isn't this wonderful? Isn't there hope? Isn't there light in the darkness? And especially, you know, I'm going to jump to the end here just briefly. The first time I watched it, again, no spoilers here, but the first time I watched it, I didn't react the way that I did the second time when I watched it dubbed. And it's not just dubbed versus subbed or anything like that. Not going to get into that fucking debate here. What I am going to say, though, is, is that I had to pee so badly. And this is not a joke. I literally had a medium-sized popcorn with a large, um, uh, sorry, medium-sized soda with a large popcorn, and I had 20 minutes left on the movie, and as the world is in danger, so was my bladder. And I finally, once the credits rolled, by the way, there's no after credit scene or anything like that, so uh, the, the song that they, um, uh, I don't remember the artist, made for this uh, movie, it's definitely a tearjerker. It really like um, helps you. Kind of, it really is a great way to sit on what happens at the end. But the second day, I actually cried, and I don't know why. It's just the way. It's not even just the way Ultraman believes in humanity, but it was just the way the end was framed. Um, every just the entire, uh, not just the last scene, although the last scene really is hard-hitting for me, for some reason. I wish I could tell you why. Um, but also the 20 minutes as well before then. Just, there was just a swelling up of emotions, and I feel like, reg again, regardless of whether or not you know about Ultraman, it is his hope in humanity that, against all odds, because he's an alien, he doesn't know us, in the movie he studies us, but it is so beautiful to see... I guess an alien species in a film study us and not come to the same conclusion that we do about ourselves. Because here's the thing, you know, when you're writing a film, obviously it's coming from your own perspective. Uh, yes, of course, I don't know how to think about, you know, what would work in an Ultraman movie. Now, I don't know if Ultraman would, should be a bad guy in the film, especially towards the end of the film. But when you look at, you know, alien films, right, it's always about the invaders. It's always, and to be fair, the monsters are, you know, uh, tearing shit up. But funnily enough, just like with, you know, many other interpretations, the monsters are from the Earth. Uh, there's also some environmentalist themes throughout the movie that I enjoy as well. Not touched on too much, but it's still something that we see constantly in Japanese media, not just Toku, and I'm happy to see it here as well. And so the monsters are not from a distant planet. They're from the Earth, right? So just like many at times, right? So 
when you look at that fact, right, it's not, it's an alien, what could have been an alien invader, that when you constantly see it written, really it's just a reflection of ourselves. And you could argue media is that just generally, of course, but it is done in such a way that it's like, oh, well, the alien invaders are coming in. Of course, if there's a foreign species or a foreign being coming in, of course they're going to want to invade and conquer and destroy, right? Well, it's been done a lot. <laughs> it's been done so much. And it's not just a, an American thing. It's done in, you know, across the world in, in different, you know, pieces of media. So to see, an, a, you know, an alien here who, again, is weird, is different, is truly alien, but to come to the conclusion that humanity is good is something that you just don't see often and it's something that regardless of some of the set pieces that you think are different and are going to be different throughout this film uh i feel as if the central themes of ultraman are still present in this film and that is what is fantastic about it is that while sure this is an ultraman in xyz check off a few you know boxes about well it wasn't filmed this way and you know he didn't stand this way and ah you know this character should have done this in this way sure but at the end of the day this was ultraman i feel you know he was fighting not just to defeat these monsters but he was fighting and not just for humanity but to help humanity because he believes in humanity. If that is an Ultraman, then I don't know what is, to be quite frank with you. So the fact that Anno, in my opinion, uh, and Higuchi, and, and again, the entire cast, they truly get Ultraman in that way. And I, I really did enjoy it from that perspective. Also, I talked about a specific reference earlier in the video that I want to get out now, so I need to be very careful with this so I don't spoil certain things. So there is a certain character's name that is misspelled and mispronounced specifically to make reference to a guide that was actually wrong decades prior. So Anno is bringing such uh, just very minute references, things that I didn't even pick up on. I thought I was pronouncing this character's name wrong. And turns out, no, it was done because of a Japanese guide. It is absurd how many little things are packed in here that, again, if you didn't know that, that's fine. You just end up absorbing the film as is. Now before moving on to the dub, I want to talk about both the pacing of the film and also uh, the cast. So when it comes to the pacing, there were definitely some people that were talking about how they didn't enjoy how it was structured. I did, even though I totally see where they're coming from, because of the different monsters that were used and because of the kind of focus that they got. In the initial first maybe 20 minutes or so, they kind of just went through monsters, went through some of the classics, but some who didn't really have a personality, so you got to see all Ultraman do his thing with them, kind of like, you know, just starting off his time on Earth and whatnot. But then as you start to get some monsters that from the original Ultraman 66 do have personality, um, and even some other, uh, some other beings that Ultraman might know that have uh, some personality to them, What's interesting is, is that, it, it, you know, some people were saying that it kind of feels like it's an episodic film, like it's cut into like three, four, or even five episodes. But the way that I look at it is, is that, well, that could be, I don't think that's a bad interpretation, but because of the breakneck speed that they went to, they didn't like cut it in a way where it feels like there could be an ending theme song, and then, ah, oh, tune in next week for some more Ultraman stuff. Like, no, the way that they set it up, it truly felt like it was just a year, maybe six months, in the life of these poor people <laughs> these these people who normally I'd be like ah these bureaucrats but in this case it's like no actually these poor people who are just you know living through especially the the humans that are on the ground that are just going through these constant these cycles of monsters that you're just like oh my god you know after this happens then something even bigger happens and they're just constantly being put through the ringer one thing i will say though so i talked about uh i was going to talk about the cast but i actually want to talk about the characters a little bit um, there's one character that clearly, I want to make sure I get her name right, is definitely a favorite of Anno's, I feel. Um, her name is Hiroko Asami, 
And I say that she's a favorite of Ano because she definitely, alongside um, Saito's Shinji Kaminaga, definitely get a lot of um, screen time. Not that the others are completely thrown to the side; they definitely have their characteristics. But those two clearly get the you know the the um, uh, the largest amount of screen time. And what's interesting is is that uh, when it comes to um, Hiroko Asami, it doesn't seem like she's interested in Kaminaga, which is really funny. She's interested in Ultraman. So. She's just like me, for real, I'm sure many of you are thinking. But uh, what's interesting, though, is that, again, she has this fascination with Ultraman, not so much with Kaminaga, and the two worlds kind of do collide. But what I find interesting is, is that I, it feels as if the way this film is written, she was supposed to, uh, I guess, really, like, form a bond, and, and she wanted to, she says she wants to be, you know, uh, Kaminaga's buddy, just this idea that, oh, no, like, Kaminaga, you know, works on the SSSP with me. I've recently been transferred here because I really enjoy Ultraman. And so, uh, you know, I want to be his quote-unquote buddy. And they use the English word buddy in the film. Uh, and it's interesting because of the fact that there's some arcs there that I don't think are exactly fleshed out. So I feel as if there was definitely some more that were that, that could have been there, that should have been there, that maybe was removed on the cutting room floor. I'm not saying that there's a, you know, oh, release the Ano version. No, 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 this is the Ano version, damn it. This is the Ano and Higuchi version. I'm sure, you know, this is the version that they wanted to have come out. But uh, still, though, I do feel as if that there was some stuff with her, not just the whole, men I mentioned earlier, the writer's secretly disguised fetish, but also just some stuff with her that just didn't land when it came to her relationship, and, and not a physical or sexual relationship, but just the, it seemed as if she was, they were hinting at her being interested, again, if not in Kaminaga, then in Ultraman, that it feels as if they just didn't flesh it out as much as they could have. Uh, I say they, again, Ano, but also, you know, Higuchi, it's a collaborative process, but it's not as if Masami Nagasawa, it's not as if she didn't bring uh, her A-game to the role. I really enjoyed uh, kind of the pep in her step that she had. There was just this energy about her that I felt was electric, so I think that she worked. It's just that it, there was just some stuff that was definitely left on the cutting room floor, I feel. So something interesting that I want to mention that I didn't catch while watching the movie because I haven't seen Shin Godzilla is apparently Yutaka Takenochi she played a government official. And I'll talk about the politics in just a bit of the film. And I'm reading here that Ano actually stated that Taganochi's character is a reprisal of his role as Hideki Akasaka in Shin Godzilla. So there were some, I thought they were jokes, specifically from Ano, making, uh, you know, light of, oh, there might be an Ano-verse, a Shin-verse. And this is very odd because of the fact that uh, not only does Toho own Toho own Godzilla, but although to be fair, they did. Um, you know, they do have the film rights, uh, distribution rights in Japan for you know for Shin Ultraman. But when it comes to Shin Kamen Rider, that's owned and being distributed and uh, just produced by Toei. So I don't think there's going to be any kind of references there. But it is interesting that you know going for a more uh, modern political angle and political spin on this not that Godzilla never had it but specifically for Ultraman um it's fascinating to see that there is a character who did come back from Shin Godzilla and I'm wondering just I'm just wondering I'm just thinking stuff you know <laughs> I'm wondering uh so you know want to see where that may eventually go um and looking at some other actors here I want to see who I can mention without spoiling the film so for any of you fans of Kamen Rider Black Sun out there, a show that I still need to see, the actual leader of this uh, version of the SSSP was actually Hidetoshi Nishijima, who actually ended up playing, let me make sure I get his role right, Kimio Tamura. And it's so interesting because he actually, uh, in the film, the character formerly worked with the Ministry of Defense. And I talked about, I've been, you know, alluding to the politics, but basically the way that uh, Anno kind of critiques Japanese politics in this film is very interesting because he critiques the politicians as relatively spineless. And it's fascinating because I look at Anno's, and I say this as an American, uh, and someone who's lived here my whole life, I look at Anno's depiction of the Japanese government and I'm just like, Hey, it's like that Spider-Man meme. I'm just like, oh, you know, or that Leonardo DiCaprio meme where he's just like, I know that one. I know that one. It's just, it's kind of interesting seeing him be like, can you believe these politicians? And I'm like, huh, whew, yeah, 
Yeah, man. I, I can believe it. I can fucking believe it. I need to center myself. I need to be like Ultraman. Believe in humanity. Believe in humanity. Believe in humanity. So when it comes to Takumi Saito, who I mentioned before, uh, some of you might know him from his roles in Robo Geisha and Vampire Girl vs. Frankenstein Girl. I remember not watching the films, but hearing about them back in the day, so it's so interesting that he was in those. Um, but not only was he in those, but he actually appeared as... The English version of the character would be known as Miles Edgeworth, but he actually was Reiji Mitsurugi in the Ace Attorney 2012 movie. He also was in Shin Godzilla, but I don't know what his role is off the top of my head, and listed here is just Shin Godzilla, so I, I assume he was in the background or something like that. And, of course, you know, Shin Ultraman. And when it comes to TV, he was in Garo, but again, no specific... The original Garo in 05, but no specific role was listed. And also, he talked about... Uh, he was interviewed, like I mentioned earlier, before the film. There was, like, a short little interview. Uh, he actually talked about the fact that his dad worked on Ultraman Taro, so he does know Ultraman. He would be either on set or his dad would, like, send him pictures of stuff from when his dad was on set. So it's actually super cool to see that um, an actor who, like, you know, knows Ultraman, was actually in Ultraman and was technically Ultraman. Now when it comes to the actress who played Hiroko Asami, interestingly enough she was in a Godzilla movie, Godzilla Tokyo SOS. She played Mana, one of the Shoubijin, which shows you that I did not watch that film. Now, when it comes to other SSSP members, I haven't mentioned Akihisa Taki, nor have I mentioned Yumi Funaberi, two of actually my favorite characters in the film. So the reason why I like these two characters is because of the fact that they just seem so normal compared to some of these larger-than-life gods, and I think that some of them are uh, some of my most favorite kind of character types. Not so much that it's funny. I'm not sitting here saying that uh, Hiroko Asami becomes like a god or anything. I'm just saying that you can tell that she's kind of Ano's favorite, so she gets a lot of stuff going on with her so just seeing how the other two react in scenes I really do enjoy their characters because you have Taki being this nerd who kind of really believes in himself and, and, and the mission and everything and just seeing some of that uh, how that plays out throughout the film really don't want to spoil things here uh, it really does work out it, it really does work out in a way that really uh, has me enjoy his character and what he's bringing to the table now when it comes to uh, Yumi Funaberi she's just this huge, like, uh, she has the huge glasses, she seems like she's like a nerd, but not in a way that kind of has her be like an outcast. She's just someone who isn't as kind of, you know, uh, uh, very spirited and very kind of peppy as Asami. And that's just the interesting dynamic that they have. Not that she's worse, not that they treat her worse, not that the film treats her worse. She's just someone who's just, you know, she she still is someone who doesn't seem like she, you know, doesn't like fun or can't have fun. She isn't a Debbie Downer in any way. She isn't bringing down the energy of the film. She just isn't Asami. And I, I find that, not that that's her only role in the film, but I do feel like, you know, she's also very smart. She brings a lot to the table, but I just enjoy that she seems like a very normal person compared to the kind of over-the-topness that Asami has. And, you know, I do want to mention the writing just a little bit more before we move on with this video that I thought was going to be significantly shorter. I very much thought it was interesting that as someone who has seen half of Evangelion, still need to finish it, uh, it very much feels as if Ano wrote this as if it was an anime, and that Higuchi directed this as if it were an anime. And what I mean by that is, when you look at certain camera angles... It was very interestingly done. Like, they didn't seem like they were confined by human beings and human bodies. And that's a very freaking weird way to put it. But what I mean is, is that there are certain camera angles in anime that are fascinating because they don't seem like they are constrained by human proportions. Um, again, that also sounds bad. What I'm trying to get at is, is that there are certain camera angles in anime that make you go, wow, this can only be done in anime. And they did them here, and I'll do a few examples as I'm talking right now, of these very weird camera angles that they did that I think were very interesting. And I think were really cool to see um, in this film. And in some cases, especially when we first meet Asami, the camera angle just following her as she's walking through a, a crowded, um, a crowded city of just having, you know, other. I think it was a crowded Tokyo of having other people be like, "Hey, you know, these monsters, freaking monsters, am I right? Yeah, no, it's it's kind of happening like earthquakes now. We just got to deal with them and move on." 
And having uh, that dialogue happen around her, and we're following her from behind, uh, from the you know from her head, kind of like walking with her through this city. It was a really interesting shot. And then of course, and and just having it, it seemed like there were, if I remember correctly, there were no sh cuts in the shot as well. And just again having other weirder cuts um, or weirder, weirder shots rather of different characters as they're talking, it kind of both ramped up the tension in some cases, ramped up the comedy but were done in ways that made me feel like I truly was a fly on the wall kind of buzzing around, flying around. So before we move on to the dub, I just want to say that overall, fantastic performances. I did enjoy the sub version of the film. I would recommend it. I mentioned the translation earlier that I could not uh, actually gauge whether or not it was translated accurately, but readability-wise, I do feel as if I was able to follow along. There were some lines that I think were a bit uh, very direct, but still, for some of you fans out there that are like, no, I really want direct lines. I really want to feel like if someone says, you know, this is a nuisance, then that's what you're going to get. So, congratulations. The sub, in some respects, was very direct. But generally, though, I don't think that, you know, with that directness, uh, you ended up losing anything. I still felt like each and every character was different in one way or another. So, let's move on to the dub. Hello. I thought it would be fitting for the dub section to shave. Get it? Because there's no subtitles on a dub and there's no beard on my face. Matt from the editing room here. I'll be here all week. And don't worry about the fact that I have a different shirt on. It's not totally a different time of the day or even like the next day or something. The point is, is that for some of you out there who might not be, uh, you might be hardcore sub watchers. You never want to watch the dub. Here's the thing though, right? If you don't want to give it a chance, fine. But I will tell you though, as someone who enjoys dubs, I grew up on dubs, and I'm sure you did as well, depending. You know, maybe more so for anime, of course. Uh, but still though, I'm sure in some way or another, you've seen dubs of different Japanese media. And I just want to say that this dub is one of the best dubs that I've ever seen. And I feel like even, yes, when it comes to live action stuff, uh, for some people out there, they're like, really? Does that, you know, is the bar like that uh, low that this is so good? No, 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 no. I would argue that when it comes to Netflix and even some other dubs as well, not all of them are good to be fair, but when you look at live action dubs that have been done by other companies, even like Funimation as well, I, and I'm talking about live action dubs here again, I do feel like dubbing has definitely gotten better across the board. Now throwing in anime, dubbing has definitely gotten better across the board. I grew up with some very interesting dubs that, to be fair, not all of them were acted poorly. It was just obviously the censorship and all this other stuff that we don't need to get into right now. I mentioned earlier in the video, I remember this, that we're not getting into this right now. But I just feel as if when it comes to the dub, and I'll talk about some of the actors in just a minute, but I just want to say right off the bat that if you're someone who for some reason or another cannot watch sub media, I would highly, highly, highly suggest checking out this dub. And also, by the way, when it comes to just the way that they did the dub, uh, they actually kept some of the lines in the subbed version that I thought were a little bit too kind of uh, direct and not, you know, they could have been changed around, but they were just very like a direct translation. They actually kept those for the dub and also when it came to some lines that were a bit too long, they actually shortened them in a way that I think worked really well and still retained the meaning because as I mentioned before, I did watch, you know, both uh, one day after another. So I actually saw the subbed version really kind of just took note, kind of squinted. I was like, I'm gonna remember almost every single line that I can. And then I saw the dubbed version the next day and I was like, wow, it is absurd how close this is. And also, you know, just being able to take all of it in, just like I did with, uh, tried to with day one, I mentioned, I used the bathroom. Um, it really did resonate with me in an amazing way. These actors and actresses brought so much of this dub that I really do recommend it. But let's actually talk about who they are before we wrap this video up. We have Chris Hackney as Shinji Kaminaga, who I actually thought was Yuri Lowenthal. It was so interesting. I was like, is that Yuri Lowenthal? No, it was not. It was Chris Hackney. And he actually really enjoys uh, Toku as well, which is actually really cool to see in the cast. Uh, I'll link down below the article that actually uh, features these cast members. And uh, uh, spoilers, there will be some characters in there that I'm not talking about in this review. So maybe don't check it out if you haven't seen the film. But uh, it was really cool to you know hear his voice. He really brought uh, this very interesting energy to Kaminaga, especially as he was, again, Ultraman in Kaminaga's body. And it really was, it was such an interesting performance, not just, again, from the original actor, but also from him as well. Uh, Don M. Bennett was actually Hiroko Asami, 
And it's interesting because she actually uh, is not a fan of the show, but just generally checked out, you know, just Toku stuff in general beforehand. And it's so interesting to see that from, you know, the cast members seeing them actually fall in love with Toku for the first time. It brings me back to, like I mentioned before, in 2009 when I fell in love with Toku for the first time. Or if you want to consider Power Rangers Toku, which I'm not saying you shouldn't, but, you know, I'm referring to the Japanese stuff here. And uh, it was just so interesting to see, you know, growing up with it at the time and now seeing the Japanese stuff as well. And uh, Brandon McGinnis was um, Akihisa Taki, and he was really funny, actually. I think I've seen some or heard some of his stuff before, um, and he was hilarious. John Bergmayer or Meyer was Kimio Tamura, and I really do think that he brought a certain uh, stoicness to a certain sternness, rather, to the role, even though the character is actually quite warm, especially as we see him throughout the film. He actually does care about the team. He's not just some stern captain, but he really does kind of uh, find that line between a stern, hardened uh, member of this, you know, this government organization, and also at the same time being in a way, I don't say like a father figure, but just someone that they can look up to but not look away from, if you will. It's very interesting what he brought to the role. And Emily Frangillo was actually uh, Yumi Funaberry, and again, she was really funny as well. And just, uh, I'm thinking of who I can and can't mention here. Oh, I want to scroll down and talk about uh, Chris Sabat. Hilariously enough, um, he wasn't, as far as I'm remembering, anyone in particular, like, you know, that you'll notice that's like, oh, this is some huge character, but you just heard him in the background, like random incidental characters, uh, especially as Asami is walking, and you just kind of hear some characters talking, some government officials, and I heard him, and I was just like, I know that man. I don't know him personally, but I've heard his voice for years. I mean... <laughs> When we talk about Dragon Ball Z, first time I ever saw Dragon Ball Z was in 99 when I was 7. I saw his interpretation of Vegeta in, I guess, 2000, yeah, 2000 probably, when the switchover happened. So I was 8 at the time. So it's been 22 years, and I've heard that man's voice on TV enough that I just was in the theater, and I was like, that's yeah, him. Oh, and then he was a general later. Uh, again, just random general that we never see again in the film. But he was like, hey, so uh, what do you want me to do about this? And I was like, that's, that's Chris Sabat. Now my interpretation, my really bad impression, that's actually him. So he was actually the executive producer and also want to talk about uh, Brittany Lauda, who was actually the casting director. Brilliant job, I have to say. Just getting this crew together, everyone felt right, which is very odd because I just saw the movie the day before and I'm seeing how these people, quote unquote, should sound, this original version of it. And yet still, they all did a fantastic job. So again, I do recommend it. Of course, I recommend, I recommend the film overall. Imagine if at the end of all of this a freaking what 40 minute video at this point is going to be edited down to maybe more i just sit back and i go terrible film uh you really <laughs> you really shouldn't check it out um I, I i hated it thoroughly no no i definitely recommend checking it out again as i've said in this video i'm gonna push it again regardless of your of where you are in your journey with ultraman definitely check it out however you possibly can I love the film. It was unique, but it still felt like Ultraman. It felt like home in a weird way. And tell me what you think down below. If you like this, oh, by the way, spoiler free. Remember, this is a spoiler free video. And if you like the video, please remember to like and subscribe. Thank you all so much for watching. As always, love you all. Take care. And I hope you tune in next time. So, I'll see ya.